Yeah. 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 Is that bias? Oh. Have someone swap. <laughs> All right. This is our improvised explosive. Uh, improvised mouse. Let's scoot over here. Come on, Zach. Yeah, I'm going to the table. Not to leave you out. All right. You all see the screen well enough? Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you, Emily, for having me. Uh, oh, you need to decide we'll make this work. Uh, our topic today is the First Amendment. The Second Amendment and 3D printed guns. You get now one right, you get two constitutional rights. Okay. Anyone ever used 3D printing before? Yeah? What'd you make? A firearm. Of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Liberator. Of course you did. I'll come back to you later. <laughs> How about you? Um, just like the stand for skis that go in the back of a truck. Okay. It was a project in high school. It was like about yay big. It was like a block or something. Okay. Well, it was like a monkey <laughs> face. <laughs> back to the gun guy later. All right. <laughs> so 3D printing is a technology that lets you take an object that is on a screen and transform it into reality. You can make something like a car, even a house, or some minor trinkets. Okay. The actual process of 3D printing a gun is fairly straightforward. You have to use code. And code often resembles plain words that you and I could speak in conversation. For example, if I want to make a cylinder, right, with a radius of five inches and a height of 20 inches, you give those dimensions, and the computer spits something out, right, using plain words, plain language to generate real life objects. Okay, you can make various trinkets of various sizes and shapes. Okay. Uh, this is what a 3D printer looks like, it's kind of an older model. Here's printing out a race car. Okay. Here's printing out a human brain, parts of the anatomy. Okay. This is actually what a 3D printer looks like in, in, in a model <coughs> approach. Uh, so, has anyone ever made a candle before? Have you made a candle? You made a candle? It makes a candle. You're from Lancaster County. <laughs> not Lancaster, there. not Lancaster. Lancaster. <laughs> um, so, how do you make a candle, right? You take a wick, you dip in the wax, you pull it out. You dip in the wax for it. Right? Keep dipping it in. And each time you dip it, it's a little bit thicker around the base. 3D printing works in a similar fashion. What happens? You put a very thin layer of plastic on top of a very thin layer of plastic, one on top of the other on top of the other, to actually make a fully fleshed out, designed object. You use different shapes, sizes, colors, and so on. This is another picture of what it looks like from a different angle. You have a heated bed, different ways of keeping the plastic warm as you grow upon it. Okay, so now I want to show you an experiment. Okay, I want to show you actually what a 3D printer looks like, and I want you to guess the object that's being printed. Okay, ready? Okay, so this is number one. This is the base level, it's called like a honeycomb, like hexagons, and it puts on a very thin layer at the bottom. <laughs> one, two, three. Anyone see it? You'll see what it is in a moment. Four. Let's see it. Five. Six. Frog. frog. Close. Seven. A toad. 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 Frog. The same thing. <laughs> Seven. Close. Job of the hot or something. <laughs> you are very close, man. Yoda. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Hey, a slice of pizza. Do I get a slice of pizza? Hey, get yeah. Pizza. Get Seven. Pizza. Eight. There it is. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. And there goes the head. Okay. So this is how 3D printing works. It involves putting down very thin layers, one on top of another. It's not very smart technology. It does whatever you tell it to do. So if you want a, a Yoda head or you want this or that, you have to design the specifications of how big it should be. All right? Now, you didn't invite me to talk about 3D printing Yoda. This guy wants to talk about 3D printing guns, of course, right? You want to make a fully functional firearm. This is the Liberator. Now, what's your name? Rob. So how did you come across to make a Liberator? Uh, it was... 2014-ish. Uh, oh, you're old school. Man. And, That's when it first came out. Yeah. And um, I 
saw when the files were uploaded and I thought it would be interesting. And uh, I was arguing that our guns control laws were insufficient. And so I made one to demonstrate the point. So it was a political statement. Correct. Now, did you do the entire design, all the pieces? Including the metal. Maybe I didn't print, obviously. You followed the, the instructions. Right. I'll talk about the instructions later. Did you fire it? I did. Did it blow up in your hand? It did not. That's good. All right. So for those who haven't made the Liberator, uh, in 2013, a law student, Cody Wilson, uh, made global headlines. He was a first year at UT, but he wasn't going to class very much. Instead, he was trying to sort of prove the system cannot work. So sort of like what Rob was saying over there. And he developed a series of firearm parts and ultimately a firearm itself that could be 3D printed. Um, what's this? This is the barrel of a gun. Think about a cylinder, it's really just a cylinder, right? With a little hole in the middle that could be used to propel a bullet. Um, you know what this is? A R15 lower. So yes, there we go. Lower. This is the what's called the receiver, the, the lower component of an AR-15 rifle. Uh, this is the part the feds actually care about. The feds treat this as basically the guts of the gun. This is what must be serialized. This is what must require a background check to purchase in a store. Um, this is what the government cares about. But you can 3D print the entirety of the receiver. Cody also 3D printed um, what are called magazines. These are the basically the boxes that store the bullets or where you fire from. Okay. But this is what really put Cody on the map. This is what Rob built. These are the components of a pistol known as a liberator. And the entirety of the pistol can be printed using a 3D printer. Uh, there's almost no metal in it. Okay. Except the firing pin. That's right. Except there's a little nail, household nail, common nail, which is used for a firing pin. Uh, obviously, the bullet can be, I mean, you guess a plastic bullet won't go very far, but you get a plastic bullet. But everything else is, plastic, is 3D printed plastic. This little round thing here, that is the cylinder. This blue thing over here, that is the 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 the, the grip where you actually hold the gun. This white thing over here, that is the receiver. That's actually the guts of the gun where the serve is contained. These little sort of squiggly thingies, these are the springs. When you pull back the trigger, there's an action and snaps back and it boom. Now how's the gun actually work? Because you don't know. A bullet has some gunpowder in it. When you strike the back of the bullet, it goes boom and sends a projectile forward. Grossly simplifying, that's how it works. So a gun is a very simple item, right? It's how can I puncture the back of a bullet safely without blowing my hand up such that the bullet flies forward? I mean, that, that's basically what you're trying to do. And Cody did this without a dozen pieces to put together a fully functional firearm. Uh, this is what the liberator looks like when it's assembled. Wait, so there is no barrel, it's just that plastic thing? That cylinder, that, that cylinder is it, that's the barrel. Wow. So for that those of you who know, there's no rifling at all. Yeah. Uh, Wait, so what's the effective range? Like, oh my God, it's about three feet. About a, about a foot. It's very ineffective, you have almost no aim. Uh, it's, it's, it's modeled after the Liberator from the Second World War. That's a nice Yeah. Uh, designed to be able to acquire a better weapon. So it's a single shot. <laughs> <laughs> take out, take out, take out, take out, take out, <laughs> right, so just for some background, this is not an efficient weapon for a lot of reasons, right? Uh, almost any gun you buy has what's called a rifle. The, the barrel has these sort of grooves in them which puts a spin. Um, think like you know, a football player, right? When you throw a football, you throw a spiral, the spin helps it keep direction, keeps aim. This bullet is just going to fly out wherever you shoot it. It's not very accurate. Also, it's a very low caliber. You get no aim. Um, one other point that may not be obvious, Plastic is a terrible material to make a gun out of. Why? What happens to plastic when it's hot? It melts, right? And then when plastic gets cold, it cracks, right? So this is a very bad thing to have a gun because the gun goes from hot to cold very quickly. Also, you notice here there's a little rope on the floor. And why is there a rope on the floor? Because you don't have to hold the thing when you shoot it for the first time. Yeah. So you like to have 10 fingers, right? I do. <laughs> um, so if you want to test fire this thing, you want to stand very far away to pull the trigger with the rope, that way you don't blow up your fingers. Now, did you treat the barrel with an acetone bath or anything like that? Did you go no. into it and you fired it? I fired it. You're, with, with your fingers? Not with my hand. No, you no, pulled the rope? Correct. So 
what a lot of the pros do is they actually treat the barrel, this acetone bath, basically nail polish remover, which hardens the plastics to withstand the combustion. Because again, if you're not careful, you will blow your hand off uh, because just you're having a combustion in a plastic box. Uh, so this is this was never meant to be a lethal weapon, right? It was, I mean, I could maybe a one shot one, right? But it's always very risky to even use this in any sort of capacity. Um, more importantly, it's not accurate. Uh, if you actually try to use this for like an assassination or something, you would fail in this world. This is not a good gun to use. Um, but it made people scared, right? That now there was this plastic gun that people could print at home and it would create terrorist attacks everywhere. It was the worst thing in the world. Now, again, a lot of this was just sort of, I think, paranoia, right? And I say this someone who's been with this issue for a decade. People just are afraid. Of they give plastic guns because they get guns. Oh my god, guns would be so easy to make. How many hours did it take you to print this thing? Do you remember? Uh, like uh, several days. It's about 40 hours. Yeah. That, that's my estimate of print time. So this takes a full week to make a crappy gun that won't really fire. But people are afraid of it. It'd be much easier to walk on Washington Square one block that way. You can get a gun there pretty darn quick. Not to interrupt, but I, I'm curious how much does the plastic cost? For making something like that, the plastic wasn't too much. Uh, I had a friend who had the the equipment, uh, but it's you know you buy coils of plastic, so you buy them like it, it, forty five dollar. The machine, the plastic's not expensive. It's the machine to get a good machine is a few thousand dollars. Even back then, it was still pretty expensive. Uh, but yeah, if you want to buy a gun, <laughs> I'm sure if you raise your hand, the block will find one pretty quick. Um, so is there a problem here, right? Is there a problem with three D printing guns? Well. When I say 3D print the guns, you <laughs> press print and the gun pops out and that's it. But that's not how this stuff works at all, right? At all. It's actually very different. <laughs> now, contrary to what people on the internet want you to think, making a gun is very, very easy. So I'm going to say zip gun. Who here has made a zip gun? Yeah, I know this guy's hand with the red. <laughs> Where are you from? Uh, from Philadelphia. Philadelphia, okay. Okay, good. Uh, you remember doing a zip gun? No. Really I'm disappointed. <laughs> uh, I need two pieces of pipe. Okay. Oh, I, you know, have you seen my talk before? No. Okay, we'll see in a minute. All right. A, a zip gun is a homemade gun that you can make from household parts that you can buy right now. So this is one design I found online. It's a soldering iron with a garden hose. <laughs> and if you sort of weld those two things together, you can make a gun. Fully functional. This is a hell of a lot better than a plastic gun. So blow up in your hand. It's meant to withstand huge amounts of heat. Uh, this is a, ju a juice one I found online. It's a flashlight keychain, which they hollowed out to make a gun. It's metal. It's solid. It'll go for an airport extra mission. Oh, it's, just, it's a flashlight, <laughs> right? And it'll fire a bullet. But to my friend Robert, <coughs> these guys will make a zip gun out of two pieces of pipe. And a 12 gauge shotgun. Yep, that's all they need. So you have a, a rubber tube, a rubber tube here. And you have a metal pipe. They have a shotgun shell, 12 gauge. And they have a flip gun cell, uh, you know, a flip phone. You know, this is really serious, right? They've really taken this, this process seriously. On the edge of the metal pipe is this little dimple, which they'll use for the firing pin to actually make the thing go kaboom. Okay. And so they load the shotgun shell into this rubber tube. And what are they going to do? They're going to jam. I don't like hit it. That's it. And the, the bullet goes. Yeah, yeah. They're going to jam this metal tube into the back of this rubber pipe. Now, what's wrong with this scene? I don't know if you can see it. The picture's not so a little grainy here. But where are they firing? So, did you fire your zip gun inside? Uh, inside, no. no. Outside, yes. No, they're firing it inside. It's and really, here you see this really little loud. yellow thing right there, right? They're firing it into an electrical outlet. So these guys aren't the smartest. So guys, <laughs> for the love of God, do not try this at home. Do not try this at home, please. And they're going to just jam this in. And there's a lot of recoil, right? There's a, there's a lot of kickback. And this guy's holding it with his hand. And his hand's kind of like really close where the bullet's <laughs> coming out of. I mean, you know, it's going to get hot. All right, so here's what's going to happen. You know, jam it. Ready? One, two, Boom. It's a great way to break your wrist. Yeah, yeah. That hurts. Because uh, there's going to be a huge kickback as soon as you pull that thing together. Um, yet, these idiots made a fully functional rifle 
a lethal weapon with a full 12 gauge shotgun. Right? This is a very lethal round you get hit with that one. How far? I mean, it's not the rifle because it's it not the rifle, it's a shotgun. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. You guys, <laughs> a shotgun. Uh, <laughs> Terminology. You'll, you'll, you'll be. It's textualist. If this hits you point blank, <laughs> Whoa. If this hits you point blank, I think you'd be dead, probably. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 uh, yeah. So Different. The reason we're being pedantic is a yeah. shotgun shoots multiple projectiles through. It's, it's like a spray through an unripe through an unrifled barrel. So you're going to put out uh, like a, a sheet of uh, lead in this case. Yeah. If you're close by, you're, you're dead. Yeah. All right. Um, but anyway, my point is they built a shotgun with efficiency, cheap parts without having a 3D printer. All right. Now, did these guys? Break the law? No, actually, under federal law, believe it or not, you can make your own firearm. Uh, you can't sell it because once it goes into commerce, however it's defined, you need a federal firearm license to actually sell. This requires background checks and a lot of different uh, sort of certifications. But if you make a gun for yourself, you're allowed to do that. And there's a very long standing tradition of making a weapon by yourself. So then, how? How have the governments tried to restrict 3D printed guns? The answer, somewhat paradoxically, is they haven't actually tried banning the guns themselves. The way the governments have gone after this problem is at the source, the files, the code, the information you use to 3D print the guns. There's been a massive effort starting with the Obama State Department in 2014 to shut down the code used to 3D print these weapons. That's where the First Amendment comes into play. If you've all taken the First Amendment, if you haven't, you will soon. Uh, but the First Amendment generally says you can't impose a prior restraint of speech, number one. And number two, you can't discriminate on the basis of content, based on the content of what the speech is. Now, a lot of these rules are saying you cannot distribute code that can be used to make a firearm. Uh, I, now, I've been an attorney litigating this issue on behalf of Cody Wilson for the last four, oh God, <coughs> actually we're in nine years, we're in nine years now, so almost a decade. And we made this argument for years that these laws are actually trying to censor code on the basis of their content and impose a prior restraint of speech. You may say, wait a minute, Josh, this speech is dangerous. It's only to make a weapon, right? Well, we have, we're using anarchist cookbook, of course you have, right? <laughs> I don't need to pick on you. No, so you're just you're just checking every box, every slide. <laughs> check, check, check. Yeah. <laughs> Been there, done that. Have right. you read anything by Palomar Press? Is a real question. Okay. I have not. No. Okay. Okay. The um the anarchist cookbook, which many of you are familiar with, basically a terrorist hand guide. We just that that there. It's a book of how to do dangerous stuff, how to make bombs, explosions, poison, weapons, whatever you want, right? And there were efforts back in the day, which are not too far from here. To ban the sale of this book. And the court said, no, you can't ban it. So, really, Josh, fine. You can't ban books, but this is code. Well, look, guys, code is speech, information is speech. This is how we engage in communication. Um, you know, there's some fun issues of whether chat GPT output is protected by the person. And I think it's actually a very hard question. Like, can, jet, it, can chat GPT libel someone? They just, no, I'm serious. If you put something in and they spit out some completely libel statement, completely false, you know, black is a, Blackman is a rapist, right? Whatever, whatever happens to be, right? Um, can I sue Jet, Chat GPT for libel? Yeah. But, but this question is a little bit simpler. Here you have people who are designing, they're artists, they're using their skills to design very intricate blueprints of how to make a 3D printed gun. And this is protected. The creation and dissemination of information are speech. Okay? I like this into the matrix. Okay. <laughs> But there's also a second amendment angle as well here, right? Now, we have a new Supreme Court decision, thank God, Bruin, but it took a while to get there. And then for the last decade, we're still dealing with two cases. First was D.C. v. Heller from 2008. Um, Heller said that the second amendment protects a right to keep their arms inside the home. That's all it said. And then two years later, McDonald v. Chicago, which said the second amendment also extends outside the, I'm sorry, still inside the home, but now against the state government as well as the federal government. Okay, but in the wake of Heller and McDonald, the courts didn't say much about the Second Amendment. We did have this language that sort of uh, the government can ban dangerous and unusual weapons. I think the court said 
Uh, Long-standing prohibitions on the sale of firearms are presumptively lawful. You know this language, right? From Heller and McDonald. Um, Bruin didn't really change that. Bruin said there's a right to bear on the side of the home. We have to use the circle analogs to see what rights are protected. But the other stuff, the dangerous and usual weapons, that's still covered. Right? So I think there are two issues which the courts haven't fully fleshed out. The first is that there's actually a right to acquire arms. That is, there's a right to gain firearms from someone else. And this is sort of obvious. Could it really be the case that there's a right to have a gun, but the government can ban the sale of guns? I don't think so, right? If you have to, if you have a right to have a gun, you have to get it from somewhere. Okay. There's also a deeper rooted right, which I think some of you people might like, which is a right to make weapons. Uh, long before we had, um, you know, sporting goods stores and Walmart and everything else, going to gun is to make it. And it's a very deeply rooted right of making. Going back to the colonial era, the Patriots, the Minutemen, they usually made their own muskets, they made their own musket balls, and this was something that we have a very strong tradition. Bruin says, when we're looking at some government regulation, we ask, is there, a, is there an analog between the present day regulation and the regulation from long ago? And the answer here is no. Because up to this day under federal law, it's legal to make your own gun. And only in certain states, California and maybe New Jersey, it's become recently legal to make your own weapon. So I think there's a very good argument that ban on making your own weapons is unconstitutional. So now there might be certain you know, exceptions like a short barrel shotgun or a machine gun. Those are sort of these weird gray areas in the law. But at least for a dumb plastic single shot pistol that won't even go more than a few feet, um, I think we're we're on strong constitutional ground. <clears throat> There's also the issue of what's called a hybrid right, which is sort of out of fashion in constitutional law, but I'll raise it anyway. When one right reinforces another, it gets stronger. All right. So here with the Second Amendment and the First Amendment, we're banning speech about how to make a gun. When these rights reinforce each other, it's a very strong basis for constitutional protection. Okay. All right. So I'll talk about the law here. Now, my friend Robert mentioned a few moments ago that he put a block of metal in the barrel of the handle. Did that one? Uh, so I was referring to the uh, the firing pin, but you can put. Uh, did you put the block of metal in the handle? I did it. I mounted it. I I was not going to hold it while it's firing, so I mounted it on a. Okay. Well, you you were supposed to. So there's a law called the Undetectable Firearms Act. I want to the character fitness. I think, do they still have that in New York or they just got rid of that? If, if you're, uh, they still have it. I think if you're a felon, they actually, oh, come on, come on in. Right? <laughs> uh, they say all the questions can't be. Uh, was it a justified crime? That's <laughs> what, 3.7 3. ounces? I think, that, I think yeah. that's it. So we have a law from the 1980s called the Undetectable Firearms Act. And this law says that any gun must have a certain quantity of metal that's sufficient to trigger a metal detector, magnetometer. And this, this was a long a law passed well before 3D printed guns. So if you did in fact make the Liberator, to comply with this federal statute, you have to put a piece of metal in the handle. It has no, no function at all. It's completely functionless, right? The, the, the design instructors say, you have to solder in a piece of metal for the sole purpose of applying this law. If you don't do it, the gun will work just the same, but it's required for the law. So most people didn't follow that direction. That, that clock is funny. Don't worry about it. What is it doing? Is it what like the hell was that? No, it just, just oh. makes ticking like clicking <coughs> noises. I've had class. Sound like before. someone scratched on the door. That's what <laughs> <was>. Protests coming. <laughs> <through. laughs> the zombies are outside. No, <laughs> the time is correct. <laughs> so the origin of the of this law actually came from the Glock handgun, which was a very popular handgun in this day. It really came around in the eighties. Basically, every rack, every rack there was with Glock in it because of, never mind. Um, it rhymes. So, um, <laughs> but people are afraid of this Glock handgun. It even makes one of the Die Hard movies with Bruce Willis. I'll read it to you. It says, luggage, that punk pulled a Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up in your port x-ray machines here, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Everything there is false. It's just, <laughs> there is no Glock 7. It's not made of porcelain. It's made of metal. Uh, it's from Austria, not Germany. <laughs> it will show up in your production machines, and they're quite affordable, right? So, but people were afraid of the Glock guns that to ban these plastic things. So that's the law we have today. Uh, there have been efforts by the federal government to ban 3D printed guns. Uh, Senator Schumer who tries to ban everything, tried unsuccessfully, and he didn't get it through, and they kind of forgot about it. 
Uh, there have been some of these crazy proposals by people don't they're talking about. We need to ban plastic because people can make guns out of it, which is just insane. Uh, guess what? You can create from metal. Um, like Terminator, right? You actually 3D print a metal handgun. Uh, so that's not going very far. But again, where most governments have tried to ban them is through the files themselves. And the first government to try this was the United States State Department. Through export control laws. Has anyone ever studied export control laws in law school or job? All right. Well, there's something called the ITAR, which stands for the, uh, oh, sorry, the acronym International Traffic and Arms Regulation, ITAR. Um, this is a series of laws that became very important from the Cold War that said you cannot ship weapons out of the country. And I think that makes sense, right? If, you know, it said you can't, you can't ship Stinger missiles to Afghanistan. Okay, I'm, I'm good with that one, right? Or you can't ship a nuclear submarine to China. Okay, I'm good with that one, right? That, that, that makes some sense, right? So if you have arms, you can't ship it overseas. But for the longest time, there was a debate. Did the word arms include not just physical munitions, but also information, designs, blueprints, and so on? And for decades, the government's position was, well, if it's something that's classified, right, again, the blueprints of a nuclear submarine, you can't ship that overseas. <coughs> but if it's information in the public domain, it's fine, you can share it. But starting with Cody Wilson, the government took the position that even information in the public domain, open source code, was subject to the ITAR. And this requires registration, you need a license to export it, and you can't send it on the internet because the internet's not restricted, you can't really tell who's a US person on the internet. Um, so what happened? In 2013, oh, the State Department sends a letter to Cody Wilson. And the letter says, you are in violation of arms control law. What did he do? He put a file on the internet. Again, he put a file on the internet. And they said, you are now in violation of export control law. Take down your files immediately. Remove your files. The law had never before been used in this fashion. So in response, Cody, who is admittedly an anarchist, <laughs> complied with the law. I'll tell you, he has been a good client. I, I have to say, when, 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 the, when, when the court issues an order, he doesn't go rogue and say, oh, and I'm not going to follow it. He says, okay, let's appeal. Right. So he got this court order, or uh, this order from the State Department, he took down the files. And that began what's been now a 10-year litigation process, which we'll talk about for a few moments. Uh, shortly after this happened, I wrote an article uh, about the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Treaty of God. And I said that, you know, this is unconstitutional, you can't ban this, yada, yada, yada. I was like, whatever, I read an article, time, who cares? Cody read it. And he called me out of the blue and said, hey, I want you to be my lawyer. I'm like, huh? He's like, yeah, I want to the government. It's like, huh? So we were talking for a bit, and he explained what happened. So after he got this letter, he actually got an arms an export control lawyer, and he applied to the government for a permit. He said, okay, you say I have to get a license? Give me a license. And they sort of just strung along for a couple of years, and he finally said, screw this, I'm going to sue. So we went to court, federal court in Austin, Texas, and we brought a lawsuit against the State Department. We sued, saying that this violates the First Amendment, violates the Second Amendment, my latest due process, we had some APA claims with the entire kit caboodle. Right? Uh, so we went down to Austin, her, or Arnie was a big, big circus. Um, we lost, and this court denied a preliminary injunction. Not surprising. Go to the Fifth Circuit. We drew a very bad panel in the Fifth Circuit. It was only the Fifth Circuit, circa 2014. It wasn't the same Fifth Circuit we had today. Different, different, different judges back then. That's a different world today. Um, Fifth Circuit ruled against us. And what's curious in the Fifth Circuit, you know, their preliminary injunction, you know, likely to exceed the merits and so on. They don't they didn't get to the merits. They said, look, this is very dangerous. There's harm to the government. We will decide the case entirely on the basis of harm. We won't decide whether you're not going to the merits, which is not how you usually do a PI motion. We filed a cert petition, which was doomed to fail, and <laughs> the court denied review. But at this point it's 2017, and things changed. There's a different administration in town. Go back to the district court, and the court says, 
all right, try to settle with the government. And much to our pleasant surprise, we reached a settlement with the government where they agreed to give us this license. Great, right? That was 2017. So you guys done? No, we're not done. <laughs> uh, so again, this was 2017. We reached an agreement with the State Department. They would give us our license, and they would publicly say that they cannot restrict these files online. Great. So then we made a mistake. And I'll tell you we made a mistake. We made a mistake. Um, we publicized the settlement before it signed. We said the settlement will go into effect on, I'll just say Friday, the dates aren't born on Friday. And we're very happy to reach a settlement with the government. Mistake. <laughs> so then all the gun control groups and states started swarming. And they attacked us from sea to shining sea. So first was the Giffords group, which is funded by Michael Bloomberg, every town, all those people. They all came at us. And they sued us in federal court in Austin seeking to block our settlement. And again, they were parties. They had no basis to challenge. They saw the TRO to block. So I argued that with myself. And I said, Judge, you know, they have no standing here. There's no argument. There's no reason why they can block our settlement. And the judge agreed. So he denied the settlement. Uh, he, he denied the suit. So our settlement was going <coughs> into effect. So this was on Friday. That Friday evening, we got the license from the government. And we said, Cody, upload, 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 right? Immediately. So all the files went online and they'll be downloaded by the millions. Okay. But we didn't make a big fuss about it, right? We we suspected something else was afoot. We didn't know exactly what, but we knew something more was coming because New Jersey had been writing letters to us. There were some of the states had lawyers on call for a PI hearing. All right, something else. So we said, upload the files, don't make a big fuss about it. And then we decided, on very short notice of an offense, that we would preemptively sue New Jersey and these other states in court in Austin for violating our rights. They sent us demand letters, they, they, they were harassing our hosting company, harassing all of our vendors, and so on. So we were going to see the Monday morning. That was the plan. Okay, so it's Friday. I spent all day Saturday writing this complaint. Sunday, the thing was almost done. We were filed Monday morning. We would not be the first to sue. The Pennsylvania AG, uh, Shapiro, who's now, now their governor over there, uh, filed a lawsuit against us Sunday afternoon. And you want to know what happened? The judge said, okay, we're here motion. We're having a hearing today in two hours. So at the time, I was actually in Queens. And I had a flight at LaGuardia at, you know, whatever it was, 5 or 6 o'clock. And the judge scheduled a hearing. So I took I, on the phone at LaGuardia Airport in the United Lounge. The old one. It's not, the new one's actually very nice. The old one's not very nice. And the judge, yeah. Where is this court? Is this back in Austin? No, Federal District Court of Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Got yeah. it. They still, so they chose their forum. Oh, they're, yeah, they're about they, to have some fun. They, they sued us. Was, judge Stein is actually a very good judge. I, I mean, when a judge says, get on the phone in two hours, he needs it. Right? So he came to work on a Sunday, and he held it here on the phone. And I said, look, judge, there are first amendment issues from top to bottom. This is a huge complaint. You have a Pennsylvania attorney general who's a Texas company. There's no clear nexus, right? Uh, we've not done anything in, in Pennsylvania. He said, look, judge, here's what we'll do. And I sort of made this up on the spot. I was like, oh, we can do it. I said, look, Judge, what if we filter out IP addresses from Pennsylvania? Can you deny the TRO if we do that now? And he said, yes. So I called Cody and I couldn't listen. You have to filter out Pennsylvania IP addresses. He's like, we can't do that. That's never been done before, right? That's like North Korea level statecraft, right? You don't usually filter IP by state. He's like, we'll figure it out. And he put up basically an IP filter with all Pennsylvania IP addresses. Now, can you VPN around? Of course you can. Right, can you tunnel around? Of course you can. Can you sit in New Jersey and, and get a Starbucks there and go download it? Of course you can. <laughs> but at least there's something to tell the judge to mitigate the harm that they were worried about. That, that you know these awful files would flood into their state, right? Because there are no guns in Pennsylvania. Just, just it's insane. I, I okay. Look, I'll tell you this one now. I'll tell you later. The Washington AG. It just remind me. He said terrorism. Which I remember later, right? So that that, that was Sunday. Here was my good. I flew back to Houston. I knew we weren't done yet. Monday morning, we got sued by the New Jersey Attorney General. Where? Essex County Chancery Court. <laughs> Newark. Ch Newark. No, this is Newark. Newark Chancery Court. And I swear I swear to you, they saw a nationwide injunction in Chancery Court to block us from posting these files. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 
How can Chance you Chance Reports is not an electronic file. It has a fax and a brief. My God, it is a fax machine. Right, so it's not all that writing. Super brief, that's New Jersey. Chance Report. And then again, I thought this judge was fair. I, I have nothing as a judge. Just the fact is, what the hell am I doing in Chance Report? Right, I had no business being there. Is that, like, give her a pro motion? No, I a pro motion. Like, I, I just got sued. This is the best we're going to get. Um, and I said, Your Honor, with respect, I don't think a chance record has the jurisdiction to issue a nationwide injunction. He said, I think you're right, Mr. Blackman. I said, okay, good. <laughs> and so I'll tell you what, Judge, look, we will block all New Jersey IP addresses, same we did in Pennsylvania, deny the TRO. He denied it. Okay, poof, good. And so then we erect what I call the blue wall. We started using the wall, <laughs> these blue states, and basically a firewall where they couldn't access our files, which was just sort of remarkable. Uh, this has never been done before, but, but you know, Cody is very smart and he figured out how to do this. I thought, Cody, you gotta, I told the judge we were doing this, you gotta figure this out. And he, he figured it out. Um, we weren't done yet, though. Then we were sued by the Washington Attorney General. And this is a coalition of 20 something states New Jersey, California. New Jersey, New Jersey sued us twice, right? You can't do that either. They sued us in New Jersey and California for the same thing. Uh, Washington, the same thing. You can't do that. It's New Jersey, right? Um, so again, New Jersey's all these states sued us, Washington State. This one was in Seattle. I did this at hearing by phone because I can't be on two coasts at the exact same time. It's not humanly possible. Um, and they argued, judge, pending on papers case, right? Prior restraint. The judge in Seattle was from Seattle, by the way, my hometown. The judge was completely uninterested in what I had to say. He just couldn't care. He didn't ask me a single question. Oh, he asked one question. He said, Mr. Blackman, you represent all the parties. I'm like, yes. Why did he ask that question? Make sure his order would stick. Make sure that every party had a chance to be heard. So I argue, 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 and so on. And at the end of the hearing, he says, okay, I'm issuing an injunction. I'm like, judge, are you ordering my client to take the files? I said, no. The ruling only said to the feds, that is, the federal government could not enforce the license. The license we gave was enjoined. Again, a federal judge blocked a discretionary license issued by the government. You can't do anything. It was complete. In insanity. This is how State Department law works. We, we actually had the license in our hand. The government said, well, you don't have to give it back. Just don't, don't rely on it. So we have this piece of paper that's utterly worthless. Said, well, if you want, you can send it back. We don't have to. It, okay, so basically the license wasn't working. Then he said, said, Judge, just to be clear, are you issuing an order for my client to take down the files? He's like, no. Then he said, you know what? Your clients are anarchists and hope he follows the law. Whoa. I said, Judge, my, my client follows all the Court orders, I don't appreciate that comment. So I clap back at him, fine. The judge kind of, rrr, 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 rrr. He, it was embarrassing. He was just making a, a, a jerk comment. You know, you can rule against a person, you can be nice, you don't have to make them attack. So then I called Cody up. <laughs> I said, hey, Cody, you know, um, we lost. It sucks. And, you know, it's emotional. You, you laugh when you tell a client you lost. That's not a pleasant phone call. Especially when you've been working, I think I had worked 80 or 90 hours in five days, just as around the clock, just nonstop. Um, I said, Cody, you got to take this up down. And he's like, well, I can't really take it down. Why? He's like, he has so many firewalls and redundancies, it's almost impossible to remove. Excuse me, hacked, right? He had all these sort of backups. So it took him a few hours to actually take down all the various protocols and he eventually got it down. And then I thought, okay, the day's over. I'm good, right? I'm done for the day. Who calls? Phone rings, unlisted number. I pick it up. This is Andrew Cuomo. I swear to God, this is true. I swear it's true. I swear to God, true. Cuomo calls me. I'm like, what's this guy? What does he want? And he said, Do you represent the gun? I'm like, Yeah, I do. He's like, You tell your client to take down those files. I said, You idiot. Uh, I was like, Your attorney general just sued me and got a nationwide injunction against me. And know what, you know what Cuomo said? She doesn't work for me. Huh? The attorney general does not work for him. That's true. That's true. He wanted credit. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I want you to take it on because I said so. That's what he said? No, but that's what he wanted. Okay. He wanted to say, well, I want you to do it because I'm calling you now. You already won. How, how did, okay, sorry. Cuomo <laughs> found a number somewhere. He so, called me to threaten me to take on the file. Can, can, we, go, we, didn't can we go back to Seattle? Oh. Can, yeah. can we go back to Seattle for a second? I'm sorry. Yeah. That's in federal court. Yes. Okay. So New Thanks. York sued you in Seattle? Yes, of course. Why the hell not? They said New Jersey sued you. They did. New Jersey all sued me in federal <laughs> court. I got sued. I got sued. Oh, I had gone four TROs in five days. All over the country. Now, uh, it, it was okay. madness. 
Got it. Okay. Sorry. So, so the problem basically wanted to take credit for taking out the guns. That's, that's why he was calling me directly. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, look, the files are down. You already won. He's like, well, you know, she doesn't work for me. I want, he wanted the credit and stuff. I said, fine, governor. I said, have your lawyer send me a letter. Of course, he never did. Uh, that got kind of weird. I said, so I said, you know, I'm from New York. I know this stuff works. I said, oh, you're from New York. What are you doing in Texas? I'm like, why? Well, I get there. I don't like New York anymore. <laughs> just like you, right? I did that last part. And then I said, you know, my parents are still in New York. I said, oh, your parents are in New York, right? That's the mafia style of uh, family there, right? <laughs> Ready for this? He said, who are they voting for? <laughs> this is before the election. I swear to you. He said, who are they voting for? And I said, well, my parents are good Democrats. They'll probably vote for you. He said, oh, good. And then, <laughs> then I was like, all right, whatever. It was actually my parents' anniversary. I didn't even call me. So, you know, Governor, today's my parents' anniversary. He's like, you know what? Tell them Governor Cuomo wishes them a happy anniversary. And he did. And like, I'm not. <laughs> Cuomo. Go <laughs> share And he wish my parents a happy anniversary. And that was the end of the day, right? So, that was 2018. That was five years ago. And we are still litigating this mess. We are still litigating this case. Uh, we are simultaneously locked in the Fifth Circuit and the Third Circuit. We are in purgatory, right? This is just like a sim pro hell. <laughs> okay, so again, we sued New Jersey in the Fifth Circuit in Texas. We thought we had personal jurisdiction. The trial court said, no personal jurisdiction. I transferred the case to district court in Trenton, right, in New Jersey. Fifth Circuit reverses it. Yes, there is personal jurisdiction in Texas. The trial court says, okay, New Jersey district court, please send the case back. What does the New Jersey court say? Oh. No, because <laughs> there's no personal jurisdiction. Fifth Circuit says, please send it back. This court says, no, there's no personal jurisdiction. So the case is in purgatory, right? This has never happened before, where a circuit court of appeals said, please return a case. And the New Jersey court says, no, I will not. So we are now, and that judge kind of retired, so I'm seeing a new judge in New Jersey trying to figure out what to do now. But basically, the case is frozen, plus four years. We can't get anywhere, no ruling on the merits. Um, so I want to give this sort of long spiel. Um, in any other context, a law banning 3D printing of a file would be unconstitutional. Imagine, you know, Alabama, right? Banned 3D printing sex toys. Give me an example. Would that be like five seconds? It's unconstitutional, right? That would be out in five seconds. But because this case involves guns and plastic guns, that people just get scared, right? They sort of lose their wits, and then all the usual rules go out the window. You can't sue the state department to block a license. That's just, there's, there's no cause of action. You can't do that. I, that was it. A lawyer from Washington actually said, I swear to God, that he was afraid that terrorists would cross the border from Canada to Washington with 3D printed guns to cause damage. <laughs> he actually said he was afraid of terrorists crossing the border to bring plastic guns from Canada to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and then the State Department lawyer actually told in the Fifth Circuit they were afraid of terrorists smuggling in plastic guns. And then Judge Jones says, go about the Mexican cartel. <laughs> 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 it's like, they're bringing guns. You're okay with the student of Obama. You're okay with that. <laughs> oh, that poor boy. I felt that. <laughs> he was a really nice guy. I'm actually, he was actually a pet sound guy, too. You know, he's, a, he's a government lawyer, so he had to argue this case. But he just, he did not have a good name for it. If you ever argue for Judge Jones, just you're... If you're on the wrong side, just 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 <laughs> just have a drink and just just just, just go away. <laughs> anyway, this should be an easy case. And we've had like seven or eight Fifth Circuit judges say we're right. Okay. Not nine. Nine's the magic number of the Fifth Circuit. And we had seven or eight, depending on account, uh, say that we are correct. And we still have not had a ruling on the merits. So I hope at some point we will actually get some decision on the merits somewhere. Uh, but again, people are just afraid of this topic. And I don't know why. I've been this for a decade. It kind of gets exhausting after a while, but I have to keep talking about it. All right, my TikTok clock says it's almost <laughs> time. Uh, Gideon, you want to ask some questions? You want to talk for a bit? Thanks, Professor. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, we don't. By the way, we're doing a. We were going to do like a little informal. We can do it. We can do it locally, whatever you guys want. It's a yeah. reference. Yeah, does it, I think it knows better when here. Well, about a few minutes ago. You, you're the two A guy. You okay. got questions prepared, and then we can open it up for, for any questions from anyone. If that's okay. okay. Yeah, so I actually had a question about the public relations aspect. Yeah. So, 
when you're litigating an issue like this, of course, it's a constitutional right, something everybody cares about on both sides of the political aisle, and of course, judges are political, so we'll say it's a bi-philosophically interesting issue. Um, how, how do you manage the public relations aspect, and how much of what you do, because we see judges, I think, write dissents for public consumption, we see lawyers just file lawsuits for public consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying this is one of those cases, but how do you manage that aspect of Second Amendment litigation? But like you said, people are scared. Uh, it's hard. I mean, we've tried very hard to build coalitions. So when we litigated before, we had advocates briefs from uh, sort of non-gun groups, Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of work with like, information privacy. Um, <clears throat> they don't want restrictions on code. That's bad, right? They want code to be free. We had a brief from the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of Press, right, which guarantees First Amendment protections. Um, these are issues that affect how reporters can report on things, right? Pentagon Papers case is very important to them. Simply saying national security should not be enough to shut down. I think what's happened with TikTok now, right? They want to shut down TikTok because of, you know, some, some uh, risk of Chinese spying. Um, another example we do is, and it sounds silly, but LARPing. You know what LARPing is live action role playing? <laughs> they 3D print weapons all the time to resemble. <laughs> I'm serious, don't have. They make weapons to resemble uh, weapons from movies, weapons from fantasy novels, and so on. Right? If you actually read the New Jersey statute, LARPing becomes illegal to be used to make a gun, right? With slight modifications, we used to be functional. Right? If you actually read the New Jersey law please, uh, closely enough, a screw that can be used in a gun is not prohibited. You can't three print a screw. Right? So these laws are so facial and constitutional, they're overbroad in every regard. But again, judges and the public just get scared with this topic. Uh, <clears throat> And what makes it even harder is this procedural morass. We're stuck in two different courts, and it makes it, you can't get out of it, right? Unless you get mandamus in the Third Circuit, which is very hard to get, you're basically stuck in the district court's uh, 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 docket because you can't appeal. You can't appeal to not transfer. Or you have to be, you have to basically wait. So we're, we're kind of stuck. Yeah. Um, so we talked a lot about the Liberator today. Um, that was obviously big news in 2014, but the th times have changed. Yeah. And the risk from 3D firearms is not a liberator. No. Right. It's an 80% lower. Right. Right. That you can put in. So for everybody's understanding, um, the only part of a firearm that is a firearm as far as, far as the federal government is concerned is typically the lower receiver. That's the part that's stamped and tracked ostensibly, theoretically, um, and controlled. And uh, you do not need a robust metal or receiver to fire a fully automatic weapon. So I can buy all the parts from a store not in New York City very inexpensively. I can print a lower receiver that takes very little plastic, very little time, uh, totally unregistered. If I wanted to, I could put an auto sear, a CAD auto sear in, make it a fully automatic select like fire weapon. And that takes no expertise. It's totally uncontrolled by the government. Um, and doesn't require metal or fancy parts or acetone or anything. Um, and that's the issue today. Right. It wasn't in 2014, it is now. Yeah. And um, so while Liberator is funny, this is real. And in the Bronx right now, and in Brooklyn where I live, um, people are auto printing or 3D printing auto sears, putting them on the back of a box and spraying up blocks. And that is a direct result of this litigation and this effort. So um, as we talk about, you know, this is just a file, this isn't just a file, right? This is a tool that you are putting in the hands of people without any kind of control or measurement and is being used to fire automatic weapons at school children. So um, how do you reckon with your role in this process the liberator, all well and good, but you know, this is happening. It's happening in Brooklyn right now. Uh, people are getting arrested with auto sears in Chicago, in Brooklyn, in the Bronx. I'm not aware of any in Manhattan, so everyone's good here. Um, how do you reckon with with your role in this uh, process? It's a really good question. <clears throat> so again, the 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 danger again is not the liberator, the single single shot pistol that doesn't work well. It's with the various uh, uh, accessories you can make. So I mentioned the auto sear, which is basically this device that can turn a single shot gun that is semi-automatic into an automatic weapon. As we pull the trigger, 
and it goes boom, 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 rather than pulling one step at a time. Um, a related issue is the bump stock issue, which I think I've been involved with as well. Um, the bump stock is kind of this, it's basically a device you put against your shoulder. And in theory, if you pull the trigger once, the gun basically moves back and forth to allow it to simulate an automatic weapon. This is what was used um, in the, uh, uh, the Las Vegas shooting some years ago. A guy was in a hotel window and was basically spraying bullets into a crowded music festival. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> the way the way I look at it, and maybe it's it's, it's shallow, but I'm happy to answer your question, is that there are certain values of a society that often will have danger. And when you take the ability of the government to restrict certain things, yes, it may make us safer in the short term, but it may have consequences elsewhere. And I do worry very deeply about the ability to restrict speech online and to shut down files and sharing information. Um, with the bump stock case, which is not really First Amendment, I think it's an issue for Congress regularly, not for the executive branch to unilaterally. So it's always sort of how do you rely on, you know, the sort of big principles when you have people dying. And that's an argument you made all the time in the law. And I think you have these sort of structures of society that exist even when they lead to dangerous outcomes. Um, you know, the issue of crime in Brooklyn and the Bronx, you know, 3D printing is probably one component of it, but it's not the only component for a lot of other causes are probably more proximal to it. Um, uh, but again, I don't know how that a perfect answer. Uh, very often constitutional law means dangerous people do dangerous things and you let them out. Uh, the entire idea of criminal procedure rights, you know, Miranda, exclusionary rule, all right, bad people can go, right? If you have bail reform, other options, okay, bad people might get out. Um, sometimes you make a decision in society that you support that may, may lead to violence later, but, but you know, it's, it's not, those words are often hollow, comfortable people have been affected by gun violence. So I don't think my answer is very good. I appreciate your answering though. Thank you. Thank you. How do you spell this S-E-E-R-C? -S -E Sear, mm -hmm. uh, S-E-A-R. So an auto sear, um, it, it's, it basically is a small piece of plastic or metal that you put in the firing mechanism and uh, turns a semi-automatic weapon into an automatic weapon. I just want to like look You can up. make it with a, with a coat hanger if you're interested. So it's not... It's not right. just I, I am not a guns guy. <laughs> so like you're, you're like I I just want to look yeah. up how this is being and used. And even before three D printing technology, you could file down various parts of totally. the lock. So it's not like it's not like this is new. People have been converting um, semi-automatic weapons to automatic weapons for as long as there've been semi. Sure. Uh, but go ahead, sort of a, an analog for for non guns, right? I don't know if any of you have followed all of the Kias that are getting uh, stolen. Uh, you know, across the Midwest, you can do that with a like a file, effectively. Why a key in particular? They don't have an automatic uh, uh, disconnect, uh, and so you can steal a Kia very easily. And the method to do it is being distributed freely. And while you used to require to have you know some machinery to drill a third hole and turn an AR into a automatic weapon, uh, in the same way that you can now distribute a file and steal a car. Uh, you can distribute a file, and a child, like I was once, uh, can print out an auto sear and turn a Glock that costs four hundred dollars into an automatic weapon. Cool. I mean, just to push back on that, Rob, a these are presumably not legally owned Glocks that are being modified. So are there are other they ways of addressing that. Be. I have, so, I, for example, I am probably correct me if I'm wrong. I'm probably the only person in this room. Who has a New York City pistol permit? How did you get that? <laughs> it took through two threatened lawsuits, but I do have. Oh, wow. uh, and so I have a I have legal firearms in the city of New York. Um, I have a Sig P320, and it would be very easy to print uh, an auto sear. And uh, but I'm just saying, like, if you look at the numbers, I mean, like, correct. Uh, you are correct because New York City gun control. And the second, I mean, you served, you know, that full auto is not that much more effective. It's no, crazy, but it's scary. Yeah. Right. And if you're, if but it's you're, not more effective. Of course, of course not. Of course not. You're to totally correct. Yeah. Okay. Aiming a full automatic is you see the moves. Yeah. Right. But ah, if if you if your goal is to sow chaos and fear, right, uh, a semi autom or an automatic weapon is a lot scarier. If I were to hear full auto right now on the street, I would be very concerned. Dude, if you if, if, if I heard, heard <laughs> single shots, you would be fucking concerned. <laughs> right? Why is it scarier? What's that? Why is it scarier? Uh, it just means that there is heavier weaponry out there. So, uh, if you bullets. hear if you hear full automatic weapons, uh, you mean you know somebody's causing real trouble. You just assume it's in the AR and not the Glock, right? 
Yeah. All right, what other questions we got? Yeah, another one, Gary. Um, yeah, so sorry, I was just, I was just talking about the guns, I was thinking about other stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was being Freud then, right there. Yeah, I do. Yes, okay, go ahead. Our, our gun after, but go ahead. Are gun manufacturers doing any, do they care to do anything about? Like I preventing think. modifications. Thank you. To the oh, oh not, thanks so much. Yes, thank you. Like, so, yeah. talk, like, like this. Uh, what is it, the auto sear? You said it's hard to stop. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess you can make the guns harder to modify, but the, the people are motivated to find a way to modify anything. Um, I think you're going to ask about IP. Are they worried about the competition? The answer is not really, because these things are not very good. Uh, people still need to actually buy the guns, but um, it's it's hard to prevent the modifications. <clears throat> Is there anything that you can do or that you think will be possible in the near future with 3D printers that you can't do just like using other materials to like alter the Well, I think the, 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 the other device that Defense Security makes called a ghost gunner, which makes basically put a block of plastic in a machine and it drills the various holes needed to make a fully functional receiver. So it used to be that to, to make the, the receiver, you'd have to have a machine press and drills is it you know it's complicated now you can do it automatically and you can do receivers not just for ar-15s but receivers for glocks and other handguns pas yeah, yeah. And basically just about anything you can 3d print uh, or drill the holes in so you know all the stuff that the atf is trying to do to restrict what uh a, a parts can be sold in the mail is sort of you know chipping at the edges but you can just make it yourself so in terms of, of innovation and following, that's a really good question about what you can do with, because the technology of 3D printing is is basically additive. So you're you're adding, you have a blank slate and you're adding okay. material. All right, last question. Yes. Well, okay. okay, I have to go to class. Like, yes, don't worry about me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. With, you know, Finish your question. Before. Yeah, yeah, sure. So it's additive instead of reductive. You, uh, usually when you're working with metal, you're cutting things out, right? And so <laughs> it's so much easier to be creative. Um, and, and, and make things that weren't made before. And so isn't the government sort of stifling or trying to stigmatize kind of the next stage of firearms innovation? Um, thank you. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, I think there's definitely a, a component of this where they're restricting progress. Uh, people who are afraid of being indicted are not going to be very comfortable with their design. So there's definitely a, a queer component as well. Yeah. We just stop there. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, we'll yeah. Thanks a lot. One hour, can you again? Uh, maybe I'll take one. Yeah, that's a lot of these. That was my favorite. Who's <laughs> the uh, local expert in 3D printing guns? Yeah. Do you have Matrix? Uh